Let us quickly revise ectopic pregnancy and the main main points that are asked in the MCQs. Now, what are the contraceptive devices that lead to ectopic pregnancy? Number one is tubectomy failure. Not tubectomy, but tubectomy failure. So, pregnancy conceived after failure of tubectomy can lead to ectopic pregnancy, followed by intrauterine copper devices, followed by progesterone only pills because they reduce the motility of the tube. Minimum chances of ectopic are with combined pills and with vasectomy. Incidence of ectopic pregnancy, extra uterine maximally is in the tube, 97% cases are in the tube, 0.5% in ovarian and 1% abdominal. In the uterine cases, it is only 1.5% cases which are inside the uterus and they are termed as ectopic. Now, it can be cervical, it can be angular pregnancy or it can be a pregnancy in the caesarean scar. What is the average gestation when the tube ruptures? Isthmic gestation, when the ectopic pregnancy is in the isthmic uh, portion, that is the thinnest area of the tube, the rupture happens at 6 to 8 weeks. When it happens in the ampulla, where the fertilization is happening, the most common site of ectopic tubal pregnancy is ampulla. There it can stay till up to 8 to 12 weeks. Interstitium of the tube, which is inside the myometrium of the uterus, that has maximum chances of growth. The ectopic pregnancy can grow up to 4 months and that can lead to catastrophic bleeding and that is the most dangerous type of ectopic pregnancy. So, when it ruptures, it is generally up to 12 weeks. How do you manage ectopic pregnancy? In acute ruptured cases, resuscitation followed by laparotomy or laparoscopy depending upon the condition of the patient and depending upon the surgical expertise and the uh, facilities available, we can go for laparoscopy or laparotomy and the gold standard treatment is salpingectomy because it is a ruptured case. RH prophylaxis has to be given. The dose of anti-D here will be 50 microgram because the pregnancy is obviously in the first trimester. Whether it's a primary or a multi, the gold standard treatment is salpingectomy. When it comes to unruptured tubal pregnancy, then the management can be either expectant, it can be medical management or it can be surgical. Surgical we will discuss later. Expectant management, the prerequisite is that it should be a beta HCG less than 1500. The patient should be hemodynamically stable and in this case, you have to monitor the patient with beta HCG at least twice a week. So, that is the expectant management when the patient is asymptomatic and the beta HCG level is very low. In the medical management of ectopic pregnancy, the requirements are that the beta HCG level should be preferably less than 3000. Some books say 5000, but preferably it should be less than 3000. So, in your MCQs, if it is less than 1500, that is basically expected management, a criteria for expectant. If it is less than 3000 with no cardiac activity, then that is a indication for medical management. In the cardiac activity also, it depends upon the sac of the gestation. Now, the gestation sac, if it is less than 3.5 and there is a cardiac activity present, that is still an indication for medical management. If the cardiac activity is absent, then we can go up to a gestation sac of 4 cm. So, that is the difference between the two criteria, the absolute and the preferable criteria for medical management. So, the tubal diameter or the ectopic pregnancy diameter, if it is less than 3.5 and cardiac activity is present, that is also an indication or if it is less than 4 cm and there is no cardiac activity, that is also an indication. What do you give? You give single dose of methotrexate. What is the dose of methotrexate? It is given intramuscularly and the dose is 50 milligram per meter square of the body surface area. So, basically you admit the patient on day 1, you call the patient on day 1, you do all the investigations including beta HCG, TCDC, CBC, her LFTs and RFTs. On day 2, you give her methotrexate, call her back on day 4. So, after 2 days, you are calling her back. On day 4, you check for a beta HCG level, then again on day 7, you check for the beta HCG level. Why we are checking twice? Because on day 4, there may be in some cases, because of the shrinkage of the sac, there may be a little rise in the beta HCG. But that is not indicated that it is a failure of therapy. Now, what can happen on day 7? If there is a more than 15% decrease in the beta HCG from day 2, or day 1 till, till day 7 after giving methotrexate, that means it's a successful treatment. So, you can just simply send her back home and call her back after one week. So, you do a weekly beta HCG till it becomes less than 5. Another possibility is that you call her back, there is a decrease in beta HCG, but the percentage decrease is less than 15%. In that case, you give her another dose of methotrexate and you consider day 7 to be day 1 of the next therapy. How many times can you repeat the dose? You can repeat the dose at least 3 times. Every time if you are getting less than 15% decrease, after the third dose, you will not repeat any other, any other dose, you go for surgery. Third possibility can be there may be a slight increase of beta HCG on the fourth day. Then you do it on the seventh day. If the seventh day is also showing an increase, then that means it's a failed management. If the seventh day is showing a decrease, then depending whether it's more than 15% decrease or less than 15%, you manage likewise what I told before. Then coming to surgical management. In unruptured cases, again salpingectomy is the preferred management because we don't want to keep the, uh, the damaged tube inside because she may have a repeated topic. Similarly, another school of thought is that if the gestational sac or the tubal diameter is more than 5 cm, it is better to go for salpingectomy. What are the other uh, surgical options? Linear salpingotomy, linear salpingostomy, milking of the tube and 
resection and anastomosis. Salpingostomy and salpingotomy are different because we are giving a linear incision. In gostomy, we are leaving, leaving the uh, raw area open and let it heal on itself. In salpingotomy, we are cutting it, we are squeezing it out, scooping out all the POCs and then stitching it back. What are the chances of persistent trophoblastic disease after, after linear salpingostomy? That is 5 to 20 percent. Very important for you to remember. Also remember that the future chances of intrauterine pregnancy are same both in cases of salpingectomy and linear salpingostomy. If they ask you future intrauterine pregnancy rates are highest with what kind of management then the first answer will be medical management, second will be surgery and the third will be expectant. Similarly, reverse order, if they ask you future chances of ectopic pregnancy are highest in which kind of management, then the first will be expectant management can lead to another ectopic, second will be salpingostomy or salpingotomy or salpingectomy followed by methotrexate. So that is all you need to know about the management of ectopic pregnancy. Read it well, it's a very important chapter. Thank you.